Today I thought we'd go over CPM, the very first operating system for microcomputers. Quite a significant thing history-wise, um, but why don't we use it today? Is it a bit like DOS? It is. It is a lot like DOS. I would use the analogy of uh, it's Betamax, whereas DOS is VHS. For our younger viewers, VHS and Betamax are types of videotape. Sometimes not necessarily the best thing technically wins out. Yes, yeah. I mean, the market forces ended up choosing the cheaper option. That's, that's often how things work. You can't talk about CPM without talking about Gary Kildall. He's the guy that wrote CPM. By all accounts, he's one of the nicest, most genuine, friendly, helpful guys in the computing world ever. Um, isn't necessarily the best businessman, though. He studied to be a, a maths teacher, um, and, and, he, and he was a maths teacher, but it, near, near enough to Silicon Valley that he got hold of uh, one of the Intel 4004 microprocessors when they first come out. It's like, oh, this, this is great for maths, we can do things on it. Um, obviously, a 4-bit processor is relatively limited. Um, but once he was able to get hold of the 8008, he messed about with it, done some things and said, oh, we can have a programming language for this. Intel said, well, no, this is just going to go in, you know, control things like washing machines and stuff like that. Why would you want a, a programming language for it? He had developed PLM, Programming Language for Microcomputers, on the 8008. He thought, well, if I could write a programming language for it, I could then use that language and write an operating system, uh, which, is, which is where CPM came from. The significant thing there really is that for microcomputers, there, there, was, there was no operating system. This was back in the Wild West days where if you, if you built your own computer, you ran your own software, that was very much your only machine. You couldn't just swap files with someone else, I want to run my code on your machine or whatever. Yeah, it wasn't like today where, hey, I've got a Linux machine, I can copy these files, here's some JPEGs, you can have a look at. No, you, you've got none of that. Every, every machine was completely unique. What Gary managed to do with CPM was to standardize on the whole operating system, except for the very, very hardware specific BIOS stuff. Kind of beyond porting stuff, it's not just a case of uh, rewriting the software to work on this machine or that machine, it's a case of this, some software written for CPM will run on any machine that runs CPM. Um, the, the only thing that's got to be unique is the, uh, the BIOS, the, the basic input-output system. So effectively CPM is made up of three, three separate layers. You've got the BIOS which talks direct to the hardware, that's the thing that actually interfaces directly to the chips, to the video controller, to the disk controller, or whatever. Um, you then got the BDOS, which is the basic disk operating system. Um, that talks to the BIOS, and that, that allows it to read and write to the disks and do do whatever it needs to do. Then you've got the, um, the CCP, the command control processor. So that, that takes the instructions that you put into it, that talks to the BDOS, the BDOS then interfaces with the hardware and runs, runs your program, does whatever it needs to do. Um, but apart, apart from the BIOS, everything else is standard, so it will run on on any any machine that runs CPM, which in, in its heyday, was up to about 3,000 different types of machine ran CPM. The first thing to say with regard to DOS is CPM came out before DOS. That was already well established, that was the market leader. When IBM decided to join in the game and they, they wanted to bring out their own microcomputer, they approached Microsoft and Bill Gates, obviously he's got Microsoft Basic, so he said, yes, we can supply that. Um, he also said, yes, they can supply the, uh, the, the operating system as well, which Microsoft at the time didn't have. IBM also approached digital research, i.e. Gary Kildall. Now, this is the stuff of legend. You will quite often hear the phrase that Gary Kildall is the guy that was offline when IBM came knocking. There's a few different versions of the story. I don't think anyone knows 100% exactly what happened there, but effectively, what it sounds like, you know, you know, going from a few different sources. He was a qualified pilot. He used to fly off to his customers delivering software and stuff like that. He was actually out flying that day and his wife answered the phone and IBM said, oh, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd like you to sign this non-disclosure agreement. We need to talk to you about this, that, and the other. And she said, well, no, you need to talk to Gary. He's out flying. Can you come back another day? So in the meantime, yes, they talked to Microsoft. Microsoft said, yeah, we, we, can, we can supply this for you. Um, 
So it was looking like uh, digital research was going to lose the chance to quote for supplying their operating system. What, what Microsoft then had to do was find an operating system because they didn't have one. Um, and there was this, this guy that kind of got something up and running that, 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 looked, that looked good enough. So Microsoft made him an offer, you know, bought, bought his, uh, his operating system for $50,000. Um, because Microsoft had, hadn't told him they was reselling it to IBM. Um, so they then got in touch with IBM and said, yeah, here we go, we've got this uh, operating system. So IBM were like, yeah, great, we'll call that PC-DOS, because we're making a PC, this is going to be PC-DOS. When Digital Research looked at it, they said, well, hang on, there might be some copyright infringements there. It looks like you've copied what we have already had on the market for years. Um, there were, there was threats of lawsuit and stuff like that. In the end, IBM turned around and said, well, we don't really want a lawsuit. It could get all messy. What about we offer both options? So digital research was, OK, yeah, we, we can live without. Yeah, we, you know, going up in a fair fight, we know we've got a better product. So yes, yeah, yeah we, we were more than happy to drop the lawsuits and you can supply both operating, or yeah, the option of both operating systems. The only thing that IBM hadn't told digital research is that they was effectively giving away Microsoft MS-DOS. I think they were charging something like $40. Um, or if you wanted CPM, you could pay $250. But it was down to the public to decide. So yeah, the public could go with whatever option they wanted. Um, yeah, does the public want to pay an extra $200-odd? Well, the fact that we're yeah, most machines nowadays are Windows-based kind of kind of answers that. These effectively are your minimal CPM applications. I know there's a video recently which mentioned the ED word processor or the ED word processor. Oh, yeah, I, I should I should say, right. yes, it's it's definitely the ED processor. Um, so that that's that runs under CPM. So if you're familiar with uh, you, using your word, word processors one line at a time, that's that's a fantastic option to use. Um, it was probably about the best that there was back in the day. Uh, I've tried it. I can follow instructions, but it, it's not, not the easiest thing to use. It really isn't. What I'm actually using is a compact flash as the disk storage. So CPM could recognise up to 16 individual disks. So the compact flash has been um, segregated into 16 different partitions in there, so hence we can see drive A, B, C, etc. We've got a pageable ROM, we've got the CPU, 64K of RAM, clock module, serial input output, and then I'm generating the video through a little Raspberry Pi that's just pumping out HDMI for me. Whether DOS was a copy of um, CPM was actually decided in the courts in 2002, I believe, um, when it was found that yes, there is there is some code that's taken directly from the source code of CPM. Um, the guy that done that, he he was very clever. He he changed a few bits. So instead of having a routine called write disk, you know he'd have a routine called disk write, and one or two other little tiny tiny changes there. But they at the time claimed that was different. But yeah, in, in the lot in the uh, courts in two thousand and two, that was all settled and. Uh, yeah, it was proven that CPM was was the original. So effectively today, any computer that runs DOS is running CPM. There's still some some of that code in there. Gary Kildall wasn't too pleased about the fact that he'd been taken to the cleaners. Effectively, um, he was. I think I think it's fair to say he was quite bitter about this for for the rest of his life, which unfortunately wasn't all that much longer um, after various incidents, his marriage broke up, he became a drinker and ended up dying in uh, 1992, I believe. Is this the sort of keyboard that people are going to get all excited about? Possibly they will. It is an original Cherry keyboard from the, the late 80s, mid, mid to late 80s Cherry keyboard. F or something like that. There was an append command that simply said add some more text and you could add a bunch of lines.